What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Bell Vista Studio Show. I have some guests here. I think this is my first multi-guest episode, actually. So patience, everyone, with me as I facilitate this conversation. But uh, the intent of the Bell Vista Studio Show is to meet with like-minded people that we believe are doing something that is of value that we need to learn more about and spread the word about. And today's episode is all on accessibility. So yes, I have lots of things to be curious about myself because I would say that I am not an expert um, and I can always be learning and this space is always changing. But I have three very capable guests, but I will also phrase that they are not, <laughs> not experts either, um, but they are very passionate about this topic. And the first thing I want to do is recognize the three of you, because I believe that you are trying to create a community that is highlighting, or you guys are called spotlights. So I'm going to say spotlighting accessibility in the training and development space. And I believe you're doing it out of your own time and effort, which is very commendable because building a community, sharing tips, responding to people, um takes a lot of time and effort so i just want to like recognize you for actually doing something in this space that is necessary but doing it because you are passionate and care about it so much and i think what's nice is that framing is coming through in the content and the stuff that you're the value that you're trying to bring to the world is coming through through that lens which is really beautiful and one thing that is even more like I think which is it's not just sharing tips you're it's really thoughtful and the two things that stand out for me are the practical advice like it's literally like I can go apply this now and then the second thing is you guys make us reflect like how might we do this with our solutions um and I want to share my screen quickly just so people that may not be aware of you've got a really cool LinkedIn group is the main place where I came across you guys the link will be in the description folks um, of the video, but this is the group on LinkedIn and it is brilliant. They're basically striving to design a more accessible learning content space. And like, look at this. This is what I mean around like the reflective practice. It is really trying to get you to think around how might you apply it to your projects and also giving resources as well. So thank you to the three of you for the effort that you're putting into this to begin with that's all my intro um so i just want to frame to our listeners right now that this is the intent of this episode is to spotlight accessibility okay we're not coming across as uh, like experts in this we're just trying to do our best with the experience and resources that we have available to us so please use it as kind of like the groundwork for you to go and do further research or to consider your perspective or how you might apply it. Um, it's just enabling or facilitating better accessibility in the world. That's the one thing. So I don't think I said who you are, but basically we've got Teresa, we got Yvette, we got Sabrina. Global, we're in Europe, we're in Australia or like Oceania or Australasia, or whatever continent. And we got the US, United States. So yes, very global audience. and foggy brains from big days and waking up brains from <laughs> the day about to begin for others so thank you for being here um okay that's my like exactly. little intro oh that's my alarm to wake up to wake up oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you <laughs> my normal time so now if it is now it's waking up you know like before <laughs> now no it's he was still like <laughs> But now <laughs> it's early. It's really early. <laughs> like what time? Oh, it's 7.30 or something like that. 7.30. In the morning. There you go, folks. That shows commitment to bring value to all the listeners and watchers. All right. First activity. Today is like this episode. Whoever's watching, it's all over the place. And there's good reason because we want you to have exposure. We want you to reflect. We want you to apply. And we want you to get resources. So the first activity, folks. My three guests. It's a true or false, okay? I'm going to say a statement and your response, you can respond with a thumbs up for a true or a thumbs down for a false. And it's just your personal opinion. There is no black or white, right or wrong response. It's just what you believe in response, okay? 
Okay. All right. So thumbs up, thumbs down for how Thank you want to go. Yep. Yeah. I need like little gold stars. No, there's no right or wrong for this one. So we can't. All right. The first one is, is accessibility in e-learning only used by people living with a disability? So we've got three thumbs down. I'm going to make it a fourth. Four. Ooh. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Four people say that but, but if someone is listening, like if someone is just only listening, like uh, we should say the word as well yeah. because they don't know what we are. It thinking. should be accessible yeah, so in this accessible topic. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. We have four votes for a thumbs down, which is uh, false. So I'm going to call on Sabrina. What is another reason that someone may need accessibility in e-learning? Well, uh, so when we think of accessibility, I think we should uh, think of it in three ways. Mm. Um, you know, it's, it's situational. Uh, I mean, somebody, a disability can be situational, it can be temporary, or it can be permanent. Um, for example, you know, if you have captions in your training, um, somebody who is, um, you know, is, is hard of hearing might be reading your captions, but then somebody might be in, might be in like just a busy location, you know, somebody trying to complete their training at an airport or like a noisy place. So that's just a situational disability where somebody might be recovering from surgery and at that point they can't, you know, uh, may, might prefer reading the captions. So, um, yeah, so it helps more than, you know, just that one person. Yeah, nice. All right, true or false, again, thumbs up or thumbs down. Accessibility only applies to e-learning training and not face-to-face -face or virtual training. We have four um. thumbs down from the voters. Anyone want to give an example of or respond to that? Give a little statement you might want to say. I think I worked as a teacher for a long time and I come mm. from like not the accessibility background, but like the differentiation background and mm. like Sabrina talked about disability just right now, but we also have invisible disabilities or invisible impairments and I'm talking mainly about cognitive impairments like you know those things that you wouldn't see and then they're holding people a little bit back so um just some of the things that I used to use in in the classroom was like for dyslexic people this. Uh, huge layover for content uh, because that helped them read better, you know, handouts and things like that. Also in terms of presentations, like this is also something for e-learning, but I feel like with presentations, people want to make it really animated, really lively with the GIFs and the whatnot and the animations. And they actually not just inaccessible or they're not just like um, causing difficulties, but they can be dangerous as well for people who have you know, how prone to seizures, for example. So mm -hmm. definitely applies to uh, in-person learning as well. Mm, love it. Thank you. Thank you. We're getting like more taste of what accessibility is in the world. So I like that this is exposing me having the intent that I wanted. Okay, next true or false. Where accessibility is scoped for a project. Okay, so it's going to happen. Should it be applied to Word and PDF documents that may form something like a tip sheet or a poster, as well as maybe an intranet or a Yammer post. One, two, three, four thumbs up. Oh, I hope we're not having group bias going out here or would it group think? <laughs> okay. So we do have belief that it needs to be applied to everything. So it's not just applied to a PowerPoint that might be at the front of the classroom. It's not just what's applied um, in an e-learning course. It extends to the scope of anything that someone may be using as part of the training experience. All right. Um, okay, this next one, I wonder if it will be controversial. True or false? All e-learning must be accessible. Oh, okay. We have three <laughs> thumbs up and we have myself as the opposite. I don't believe it. Okay. What 
Teresa, what's your fight for it being accessible for all e-learning? Well, I will say that, um, of course, well, I am trying to understand why you have a different opinion. And I will say, um, if you analyze your audience, then um, maybe you know in advance um, if people need some uh, this access accessibility features or not. Mm, and then you might make a decision um, about the, the features you want to have uh, in your training or in your offer. But I will say that for me, um, I'm, I, I, I've been learning to change my man mindset to have accessibility as a default of the um, design process, you know, because in my experience as well, <laughs> maybe we talk about it later, but mm -hmm. I, I learned it the hard way, you know, like I learned it like, like at the end, you mm. have to, 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 to um, have, uh, how do you say, like, there, there are some requirements you need to fill, and I didn't think about it from the beginning, and it was a lot of work and it was very frustrating and I as I said I learned it the hard way so I've learned that if it is part of the of your design process from from the beginning as a default as well as any other things you always have to um, take into account then for me uh, everything everything is going to be everything you offer is going to be accessible that's maybe my position I don't know what the other one um, have to say about it. Yeah, well, I, think... I would say that, um, I'm sorry, go, go on, I didn't mean to. No, you continue, continue. Through. Yeah, no, so uh, so when you're, when you're designing your e-learning, I mean, you obviously want to meet all your learners. So if it's, um, and then, you know, like Yvette mentioned, th there are learners who could have invisible disabilities or disabilities you don't know about. So um, it's, it's just not them, but if, if your aim is to meet all your learners, then if your learning is not accessible, you're not going to meet all of, you're not going to reach all your learners, right? You, uh, I think uh, uh, in the US, the statistic is that at least one in four, four people has some kind of disability. So that's a lot of learners you're not reaching. I mean, this is, I'm only talking about this country, but globally it's much more. So uh, yeah, that's my reasoning for it. Yeah, I believe in Australia. And just one, more, just one more thing to add to that is that like, have you ever tried taking a course on your mobile phone? And because if, I always have this issue of like trying to tap the button and I just can't and I'm, I'm excluded then like I can't continue with the course. And, you know, so so these are just considerations. And one more thing is that there's this motto that I read a lot in like accessibility forums is like practice over perfection, right? So taking small steps is better than being perfect. So when we say like all early learning should be accessible, I'm not talking about the whole range of accessibility, like to fully comply. I'm just like trying to do our best that we can so that we don't block the learners from processing the information or progressing in the course. Yes, yes because I think you, I, I, I guess you are going to um, talk about it later, but there are like some basic stuff like if you start taking small steps and just changing some basic stuff you are going to make a big difference like for you for you these are just small steps but you know like the impact of um this is going to have like maybe you 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 can imagine it right like mm. just so so i think that's our point our standpoint so like yeah. don't try to be perfect like just one step at a time. I think we have also that on our description, you know, like it's kind of yes. a motto. One step at a time every day. Yeah. And I think that is the thing is like, as you consider it, the little things that you're saying, it becomes part of your pre-planning development, you know, like, so you start to think about, yes, maybe color contrast in this project. And then you kind of always default to just making sure your colors are working together. And over time, you'll build your own little checklist or toolkit that means that you've planned in advance, not fall into the trap that Teresa did and us at Bell Vista Studios where for the first time we ever did accessibility, we did it at the very end. And then we realized that we basically had to redevelop the whole course from scratch 
and that was a lot of rework. So yes, I think this one step at a time every day, build your checklist, which is where we're headed at the rest of this podcast, and um, will get us to a place of pretty much that's just the way you build it in future. Um, yeah, and I have I'm a quick say, thing. Yeah. Uh, I, have, I just have a quick thing to add, you know, uh, because I'm, I'm so used to looking when I look at content, you know, the first thing that stands out to me is it's not accessible or, and so recently I was uh, looking at a presentation, it was for a college tour, um, you know, and the college was doing their presentation and I just could not focus because all I kept thinking was how their uh, the background and the text did not make color contrast. And I just could not focus on, on the content. So, you know, mm. I think it's just as you keep doing it, it just becomes, you know, inbuilt and inherent in everything else that you do. I agree, definitely. Yeah. Um, I'll just close off this one in that I put a thumbs down because as you know, we're pretty big on like human centered design and knowing your users. And I feel like, you don't know until you know, so you've got a seat to understand. So that's where I was coming from, which is, you know, just asking the questions in the first hand, like if you're going to the full on WGCA, WCAG 2.0 checklist, you know, is it AA, is it AA, is it AA, A, 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 those ones, but like, are there, pe what are the accessible requirements? Is it something that there is one person that needs to be considered for color contrast? Is there one person that uses a screen reader? Potentially then you don't do screen reader solution in the e-learning for that one person. You think of a completely alternative approach. So I think for me, it's seeking to understand the extent of accessibility and who the users are, where they're gonna be using it. Um, so that's why I gave it a thumbs down. All right, nexty, nexty. Um, oh, this one. I feel like we get this comment a lot, so I want to see what your opinion is. Um, true or false? So thumbs up, thumbs down. Four. Accessible e-learning cannot have decorative images. Oh, I'm so. I can see like frowns going. Like, there's obviously some passion around this. So, all four of us have gone thumbs down, which means that we do disagree and believe that images can be decorative in our designs. Um, Yvette, I really feel like your frown was the strongest there. Do you want to express <laughs> why you're like compelled to? I was have just that like, I've never heard that before. That's why I was frowning. I think I was like, that has nothing to do with accessibility. Like, you could still make it you know, appealing um, to everybody because that won't exclude people. You just have to make sure that you, uh, you're applying the right null alt text so that it won't be a problem for people with screen readers. But yeah, I mean, visual appeal is important in courses, I think, because, you know, first impressions do matter. Yes, yes. We're going to go a bit deeper into that one. Uh, we have, I've got a little case study, so I'm going to park it there. But it I'm glad that we have four opinions on the same thing because I feel like a lot of our YouTube videos are like um, that you can't use the, those images because they're not accessible. And I'm like, this is not like, yes, you can use decorative images in a course and it still be accessible. So we'll deep, in, deep dive into that in a minute. All right, my last true or false one. Potentially another debunk myth here that will blow people's minds, true or false. Accessible e-learning must have voiceover to narrate the text on screen. Ooh, a little bit of- I'm kind of halfway on that actually, so. <laughs> okay, so we've got three of us voting for false and Sabrina, you're saying halfway. So go on, let us know your thinking. Uh, so I think it's, I need to really think about how I, I need to frame, uh, frame this answer. So it's, so yeah, so again, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a mix of all your learners. So if you have somebody, um, suppose you, you have a video, um, this, this is not exactly why, so we're, um, honestly, you know what, I'll come back to this answer. I need to process okay, it okay. a little bit. I'll let somebody else talk. Thanks. Maybe, yeah, maybe um, I think I think you don't need to, but you can give always the option. And some basic principle is like you don't have out of play audio or video and anything. So if you just have the option for because people who 
um, have a screen reader, may don't need it, you know, like the screen reader is doing all the work, but there are people because of the situation and so on, they, they don't have, they don't, they don't use it um, in everyday life. So for these people, you, you have this option, but it's always the option that you can display or stop or pause as, as you want. So if you give this option, that's for me, like the, the principle. Yes, I agree. I think that's yeah. in the guidelines as well. And I think people need to um, just consider like the user experience of that. If you have text on screen and the alt text, which is literally reading out to someone the text on screen that's in the alt text, which should be done in a tailored way that serves the same learning experience for people that are using the alt text and not, then you're basically having the screen reader read what's coming through in the voiceover. So that user experience is very, very poor. And that's what Teresa is saying, you need to be able to turn that on and off. So just on that, I'd recommend people download a free screen reader and give it a go so they can really appreciate what that actually is like for learners that use those um, tools. Sabrina, and then, yeah, so learn I... how, to, how to tag, sorry. Mm. No, so I was just going to say if I if I can come back to what I was trying to say. So I think um, it it can be beneficial to some learners. I mean, it doesn't you don't need to have voiceover all the time. But I think, like Teresa said, it would be good to have an option to turn it on or off because you could have some learners who might benefit from hearing the content versus you know just reading the content. Um, you know, or some, you know, some people with cognitive disabilities or somebody who's, um, and, you know, who's not a, a native speaker, English, you know, English is their second language might benefit from, uh, from a voiceover. Um, so, you know, there are so several nuances when it comes to that. And, um, and I don't think the voiceover clashes with the alt text because the alt text would just describes the image. So it would not, uh, it would not essentially clash with the voiceover, like the screen reader and the voiceover um, and the alt text. I, I don't want to make it confusing. So, but what I'm trying to say is the screen reader will only read the alt text of uh, an image, um, you know, depending on where you set the alt text. And uh, usually it's only if the, if the image is beneficial to the content. Um, if it's decorative, we would, we would not add an alt text to it. Mm. Teresa, you're going to add something at the end as well? Um, I just wanted to say that, um, that I think the important thing is to have the right descriptions for the screen reader, you know, because even if you have the play button, um, if you have the right description and people are listening to the screen reader, then they can decide if they click, you know, but they know in advance because you wrote the right description. Um, they know um, what 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 uh, all elements are doing in, on the screen, and then they can decide of um, about um, selecting or not. You know, mm -hmm. that, that's why that, that's why that's why descriptions um, play a, a big role, and um, that's something that I think we are. I'm always saying in 2009, I um, I'm still struggling to to learn how to write. Um, the right um, image descriptions and how to make my alt text um, mm. as good as possible. But I think it's a matter of practice. And yeah. Well, actually, while we're on that, I, oh, do I do? Okay. Before we go on to that, I'm going to give you 10 seconds, right? I want you to re think about a myth in this kind of space that you want to debunk and you're going to get the spotlight to just say, People may believe this, but this is an alternative for that. So I'll give you 10 seconds to kind of think about it. And then when you're ready, let me know. Sabrina, you got one? A myth you'd like to debunk? Well, you'd like me to start? Yeah, go. Um, I think one of the common one, uh, ones I've um, heard or seen is that, you know, it makes your training boring or it kind of sucks the joy out of your training or, you know, just your design. 
So I, I don't think that is that is true. You know, just um, making your course accessible actually, you know, makes it reach more people. And um, you know, you you at that point, you know, you're considering all your learners and just not a few. And I don't think it's true that you know it it just makes your training boring or um, you know, people are not going to be engaged with the training. I think it actually, you know, like I said before, it just reaches more people in different kinds of situations. So I think that's that's one of the myths. I love that. I feel like that also makes you, does I like, is it an, uh, the questions coming up for me is, is it an excuse um, to hide bad training behind accessibility I, or does it make you go, no, this needs to be intentional? and make sure that adds value to my learner's life. Yeah, and I think a lot of it is just not being, uh, it just, if if you go to one of, you know, like the WCAG related uh, websites, it's, it's mind boggling and confusing. So I think a lot of it is just not knowing how to approach it uh, more than, you know, just not wanting to do it. I think it can be confusing, especially, if you're new to it, uh, you know, it, it takes a while to actually understand because it's an extreme overload if you if you look at the website, um, just to understand what's going on. Yeah, but every day, one step at a time. All right, Yvette, what's your myth you want to debunk for us? I think Sabrina covered the biggest myth already. Yeah. I think right. the, the other one is, um, you know, that accessibility is about disabilities and in particular that it's about people with visual impairment and hearing impairments, because it's it's not, because, um, you know, when I started learning about accessibility, for example, I was like Googling accessibility, e-learning, whatnot. And then all I had was coming back was color um, uh, color blindness. And I was like, that that's not it, there's more to it. So, you know, like, um, I feel like a lot of people consider, as I said, hearing and visual impairments, but there's, a, there's motor imp impairments as well. That's why drag and drops are uh, not recommended because not everybody uses a mouse. Mm -hmm. And also, as I mentioned before, cognitive impairments as well. Cool, thank you. And as Sabrina said, situational uh, difficulties as well, not having earphones, for example, to listen to the content, so. Yeah. Thank you. Teresa, what you got? Um, yeah, I will say that to think that because you make it accessible, it's not going to be interactive or um, nice, uh, you know, like, um, because even because of, if, if they talk about drag and drop and there are some um, very helpful um, posts in some of the in, in some communities about how to make drag and drop accessible if you want to have this kind of interactions. But I uh, have been working on a project and a big project, and uh, someone um, maybe I can mention. T thank you, Fabian. Um, uh, uh, a good friend of mine who is also a developer. We were working together on developing. Um, on make, making sure that the interactions we are offering for people who can use uh, drag and drop and so on, ha, that they are also um, doable for people using a, a keyboard. And mm -hmm. that was fun because at the end, it was very fun to see. It looks like you want, like you want it to look uh, and, and it works. So it's just like trying to find a solution, you know, like, it kind of reframes, and I would say for me, the big myth is that um, if it's accessible, it is going to be boring. So I will say um, that's not the, that's not, or it's not going to look nice, you know, on screen. And I will say that's not true. Good. Okay. Well, I want to draw on, like, go further into what you were saying a bit and um, around the myth of it's not always just for people living with a disability. And I think one kind of thing that we could do well here is to just expose people to where accessibility may exist in our lives. So um, what I want you to do again is just think about maybe an assistive technology um, and why someone might use it just so we can expose people to what that might be. I'll um, start with an example because I want this to be an awareness kind of podcast. So have a think yourselves about an assistive technology that you're aware of and why someone may use it. 
for listeners at home while they're thinking this is going to be hard for you to think and me talk at the same time maybe i'll give you a or i'll give you the example then you think right so i remember the first when i was in primary school i came across this which was braille um actually at the time i didn't know it was being accessible um but that is where it comes up and where i see it now is you know on toilet doors in the lift they have the little bubbles um so that is one area of accessibility in day-to-day -day life and another one that stands out for me is um at traffic lights so in australia our traffic lights you like if you can't see the green or the red, well, the poles where you press the button to call and say, hey, I'm ready to cross the road, they beep, a loud beep when it's being pressed. And the other thing is if you actually touch the pole, it vibrates. So that's quite cool. Cause then you can, you have audible like, and physical like touch, multiple sensors are being called on to help you cross the road safely. So that's my assistive technology idea. <laughs> Who's going to take screen readers? That's the biggest one, I think. Well, you claimed it, so you're allowed to go for it first. <laughs> you want to explain what they are? Oh, screen readers. Um, yeah, so they mainly for primarily for people who um, who have visual impairment, so that it reads out um, the text on the screen and then um yeah that's <laughs> that's the main reason why screen readers exist so it's anybody who who can't see the screen can't read what's on the screen but also if you think about what sabrina said before about situational impairments i use screen readers not the not the 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 um jaw screen readers like the professional screen readers but i use screen readers as well sometimes to read out articles for me for example mm. you know when i'm like multitasking or something um but for for like the professional screen readers like jaws for example that's a bit more specific as well because you can navigate through the content as well you can use shortcuts to get like jump to certain parts of the content easily as well yeah thank you yeah i will say the whole text-to-speech technology and software because um, I mean, there are people um, who cannot um, like type, right? And then you can just like speak and the text is going to be mm. written for you. And that is something that you can also use um, as a person with, without a disability, you know, like, yeah. yeah. So um, I would say that's also very, very useful. Mm speech to text technology. Yep, I love that. It's made my life so much easier. Sabrina, you got a, an assistive technology that may exist in the world? Yeah, so there are people who use uh, mouth sticks. So hmm. actually it's, uh, you know, uh, people who uh, usually have motor impairments or, you know, some uh, disability with their limbs and they actually use it it's it's like a stick and then they use that uh, you know to tap on their keyboard um in, instead of typing so um yeah it, it's it's called a mouth stick cool thank you thank you all right third part of this podcast this is where we're going to put the spotlight on some things all right so i'm basically going to say how might we make x more accessible and it's just we're going to build on each other's ideas so your sentence must start with yes and okay so we'll go i'm going to give us an order if you don't mind uh just looking at my screen we'll go yvette first for answers then teresa and then sabrina and we'll just go around in a circle and say yes and and no right or wrong but just trying to make it more accessible okay so no pressure starting us off there. I can I can start it if you want. Would you like me to start or are you comfortable? No, let's start. You got it? All right. How might we make alternative text more accessible? And then we just start with yes and? Yeah, you, you get it. You off start and then. Yeah, then to really Oh, start. okay. Yes and. Well, the first thing is to add the appropriate alt text in the appropriate box where it should go. 
Yes, and to be concise with the description. Uh, yes, and not to add it to descriptive images. I mean, yeah, um, sorry, not descriptive. Um, you know, not to add it to images that don't add to the content. A decorative yeah. image. Sorry, I, I'm just having like <laughs> no, this short is good. Of memory loss. Yeah, but yeah. Yes, and um, read it out loud, your alt text, to experience what it might come across to as if someone's listening through a screen reader and make appropriate adjustments. Mm -hmm. oh. All right, round one done. There's more, there's more, but we're just giving you a taste test, everybody. All right, next one. How might we make hyperlinks more accessible? I bet you start us off again. Um, instead of saying click here, you have you include a description of what to expect. You want to give us an example, please. So instead of saying click here for more information, nobody knows um, what that more information unless you're reading the context. But yeah. some people don't read the context; they just jump around. So click here to find out more about how to apply for to for credit card. Beautiful. And then the hyperlink is not the click here, it's the how to apply for a credit card. Yes, and make sure um, the color is contrasting with the rest of the text. Just like to identify, like, you know, we know hyperlinks are underlined and have a certain color. So make sure you are meeting those criteria. Did you just steal two and now it's making Sabrina and I's life way harder? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Boot her I'm, off. I've been thinking <laughs> as, as you're talking. Yeah, but I have one. Um, so yes, and make sure your screen reader can access it. So make sure that it's in your focus order so that your screen reader can access it. Damn it. <laughs> that was mine. Yes. Um... <laughs> I have one for you, Kim. Um, Go, because thank I you. click here and actually click is kind of not inclusive because not everybody is clicking so select here or you know um follow this link would be better beautiful thank you all right next one um how might we order the content on screen to make it more accessible so i'll just give you we might consider things like headings body text tabbing order focus order that sort of stuff in this one so i'll repeat it again how might we make the order of content on screen more accessible? Okay, I'll start with something that I didn't know, so I was doing it wrong, um, is actually um, using the right header HTML coding, because what I used to do, I was like, I don't like what it looks like. So I just used the body text and then I edited it, edited the bolding, the right uh, font size and everything, and didn't apply the right HTML, like header one, header two, whatever code. So I made it inaccessible. So yes, just use the right, um, what is it called? Like the HTML. The, 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 text, um, the, text, yeah. the text styles in some authoring tools, it's called text styles, yeah. Yeah, yeah that one. Yes, and um, use a screen reader just to um, to check, to double check the order. Like just don't put it on your authoring tool and then like make sure it is the right order. And like maybe it help you also help you to, to, to have a feeling for the flow of the whole um, text, yes. Yes, and so preview it and experience it out of the development yes. tool. Yeah, so uh, yes, and make sure it's, you know, in the, the reading order is based on, you know, the country you're developing for. So it's usually top to bottom, left to right. So uh, otherwise, you know, it's, it's going to go all over the place. If, or you, your learner won't understand what, what the slide or the, the, you know, what you're talking about if your order is not correct or, you know, if you don't have it in the top to bottom, left to right. That's how I do it. But based on, you know, the reading order you follow. Mm. 
yes and order it in higher and like order of priority on how someone might want to interact with it so for example heading text on the screen potentially then the image and then the next button back button um and any other things i think things that actually and then if you have like click and reveal screen then the click and the buttons must be interactive before the next button so in order of priority on how someone is likely to want to interact with your screen god the stress of going last i tell you that i'm um, so glad I'm, <laughs> I'm just gonna end this activity right now i think everyone's got some great ideas and we can just relax and do something a bit easier now nah, this is awesome thank you so much cool, so cool. far we're doing we're exposing a lot of good practice things and it's about that mindset stuff. So I just want to make people more aware, which I believe you guys are like really big into. So I think we're just exposing things here. So let's get into like truly exposing. I want to show some uh, uh, case studies. So the first example we talked about alt text is an example by you, Teresa. So, um, you know, see how good a role model you are right now. I'm yeah. going to share my screen. So we have an image going to appear on screen now. This is a recent post that you did on LinkedIn about the growth mindset. And it is highly visual, highly aesthetically beautiful. And you have done the great thing by putting in your alt text um so i just want people that are watching this side of it at the moment to have a look at the visual which is as i said just highly visual but it's tips it's practical tips it's reflection it adds values to people's lives and therefore it's not just a decorative image so this is how i wanted to dive deeper into like sharing the value of why decorative images can be made accessible now i'm going to go into the actual post side of it and we've got an image description so people that are watching at home on YouTube, on the video side of it, have a look at the image description there, maybe pause the video so you have time to digest it. But Teresa, the question for you is, what kind of criteria did you use or what was your thinking in how you wrote this image description or the alternative text for your highly visual piece of value? Um, well, I think the first criteria and something I am still struggling with is that it it shouldn't be like long, you know, because if I start describing the whole image and in detail, then I'm going to have like, you know, a very long paragraph. And I don't think that's the point of it. That's not the point of an image, of, of an image description. But for, for this uh, sketch note, it was because they, you know, like you have this, this, this me <laughs> um, with, um, how, how can I say, like the, the message is also uh, important for, for, for people um, who cannot see the image. And that's why I, um, because it is not decorative, but it is also the image is, is sending a message that um, complements the, the text. So um, I needed kind of, make um make sure people who just read the image description um get also this this like this atmosphere you know like yeah. this um yeah from from the image so that was important and then after that like once i um, set the atmosphere of the image then i just go and write the 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 the, the the text because that's what what's important right like the message you want to deliver for people who can see the image is are, um, are those uh, steps that are listed mm -hmm. there so um and and as, as i said i'm still like learning and <laughs> i'm still like every time i have to write an email description i just think a lot about how how mm -hmm. can i make it the best way and yeah well i think what you demonstrated really well here is that if you didn't have the image, your image description gives you the same value as if you do see your sketch note. And I think that's accessibility done well. So yeah, thank you for that. Thank you. <laughs> Does anyone else have a tip on uh, maybe what they wanna say about alt text or that we haven't already covered? Otherwise I've got another case study to go through.
not from me sorry <laughs> I don't know. I think I'm sorry. You've already yeah, shared like, many examples. Yeah. I will say, like the the first, the, the for me, the most important thing is really like try to be concise. Like mm. just if don't don't get lost in, in the details. You know, like because a, a very detailed text is not is not going to be accessible at the end as well. Like just try to go to the point. Yeah. With uh, yeah, and I think a good accountability check there is like if you timed yourself to read the image description, how long might it take? And is that necessary for the outcome that you're trying to achieve? Because if that, I don't know how long it would take, but if it took two minutes, but it was only like a three sentence thumbnail, then it's probably not a good use of someone's time. And it's not giving the same experience for someone that is looking at the visual versus using the description to get the same outcome. Sabrina, did you have anything or otherwise I can move on to another case study? I know, I think I really love, uh, you know, the alt text. I think it, it's perfect. You know, it it kind of uh, lays out what, uh, you know, it's it it's about and then it, it just tells you what the other points are and it's, it's very concise. But, you know, you can, you know, if you close your eyes, I think you can exactly picture, um, I mean, without looking at the visual, if you read, and close your eyes after you read it or maybe before uh, you can actually tell what what it's uh, talking about yeah. yeah definitely all right thank you thank you okay the next one i just want to also frame for the people listening and watching this is that these guys had no these my three guests had no idea what was coming up today so thank you so far <laughs> so much so far for how well you're doing and the value you're bringing um they're being really put on the spot. I'm spotlighting you guys now on your talents, um, <laughs> but you're bringing a lot of value and the way you're articulating and the tips that you're sharing really are exposing and building that awareness. So thank you so far for doing such a great job as my guest. All right, the last activity I have is, I'm gonna show you a RISE course, okay? And um, for the people watching at home, doesn't matter if it has accessibility done well at all or um, not at all, the idea here is that I want us four to work together and demonstrate the mindset of how we might get to an accessible course, okay? So what I'm going to do is show a RISE course and I'm just gonna scroll through it slowly. Don't read the text, don't worry about that, but it's more the functionality and the visual look and feel. And there may be a bit of talking over each other in this, that's okay. But what I just want us to do is pretend we've been just given this to QA or to like review for accessibility purposes and just call out. I need to remember alt text for that image. I need to check the tabbing order of that. Would the default, um, what do you call it? Development tool consider accessibility here or would it not? So we're basically gonna help people build their own checklist like we were saying at the beginning of things to consider in their own accessibility practice, okay? So just thinking out loud what you might consider in terms of getting this to an accessible course. There's no right or wrong. We're just trying to figure it out together because it's really about the mindset. It's taking the time to just consider accessibility mm -hmm. in the first place. All right, sharing my screen again, or we'll be revealed. All right, rise course. It is here. I'm just going to scroll through and just start thinking about what comes up. So I'm definitely myself coming up with like, have we got alt text for these images? And also if they're decorative and we're gonna put the blank in, what is RISE or my development tool of choice going to treat a like blank inverted commas um, alt text for an image. So I don't know about this text um, directly on the image. Mm -hmm. um, cool, so you're yeah, flagging to figure out if that's if accessible. Yeah, I don't think that, you know, it's usually not good practice to put it directly on an image. I would probably have some kind of uh, like an overlay 
um, just for the contrast here. Hmm. Thank you. So we've definitely got like different colors going on, like font color and also white on a color. So I'd bring up that web aim contrast checker to make sure that it's legible. And also in terms of the size, like maybe it's legible at this size, but maybe it's not at a smaller text font size. So I'd want to check that. Yeah, so maybe change, um, let's say it's a rectangle. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I, I kind of missed where it went. Say that again, sorry. Uh, the one that says the rectangle below is a clickable button. Maybe um, instead of click, you might want to say, um, you know, you can select the rectangle below to mm -hmm. do whatever because it doesn't really tell you what it does once it, you click it. You know, maybe yeah. use some kind of language which kind of tells your learner what, what would happen next. Yeah. Thank you. I think there's something flagging around um, italics actually for accessibility. It might be yeah, at the it's AAA not, level, so. Yeah, it's not very readable. It's um, usually you would you know rather avoid using italics. And if you want your text to stand out, I think bold is a better option using bold instead mm -hmm. of italics. Yeah. yeah it's not Beautiful. just italics, it's also underlining as well and all caps. Beautiful. Yeah. All right, we're starting to build our little checklist. Thanks, folks. Keep going. I yeah, think so, I read the, sorry, Sabrina, go on. No, no, go on, Yvette. Oh, I was just going to say that I, I read the um, RISE accessibility, um, was it, what is it called? Like the statement of what accessible and what isn't. Mm. And hover help, this kind of hotspot section is not accessible to screen readers, I think. It might have changed since, but that's the last thing I knew. Mm. That's a really you know, good Sabrina. point that, um, each of the development tools have their own kind of almost checklist against what is accessible in their development tools and what's not. And also, yes. I think you've got to remember they're constantly updating it. So make sure that you're using the most recent documentation to develop to what is required or addressing it to stay current. So over here you had audio before and video, mm -hmm. so I would just make sure you have captions. Um, so your audio, I would ensure that the audio, if it's only audio, I would ensure that it has a transcript to go with it. And then uh, the video should have captions. Cool. And also player controls. You need to make sure that your learner can play, pause, replay. Oh, at their own pace. Mm. Yeah, you, you do have that. Yep, very good. I saw that emoji above. Mm. That was not an emoji, but just, yeah. What should we um, I just spotted it. I don't have an opinion on it. So I'm just wondering if anybody would want to. Mm. No, say good something highlight. It's something different. We need to consider how it's treated. Anyone got because emojis that? are read out by screen readers, but I'm not sure the screen reader would interpret it as an emoji. It would be just punctuation. 
but I'm not sure. Does mm. anybody know? Good one. I will say the same. Yeah, and also, you know, uh, I mean, unless you label it, everybody might not know what it stands for. I mean, it, it's easy to think that, hey, you know, everybody knows or it's just intuitive, okay, it's a, it's a frowning face, but it, like you use icons, your icons always need to have a label. Um, I would label it if that's important, you know, or, or even if it's not, like if it's part of your content. Yeah. And that also reminds me of like acronyms and stuff, making sure that we're being descriptive the first time they're used and it's clear then throughout mm -hmm. the rest of it. Um, I am conscious of time because we've now hit our one hour. So I want to be respectful of your time and just wrap us up within the next five minutes. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah okay. The learners at home are going to be like, oh, crushed now because I am, we're not going to experiment anymore with that. But I believe that sort of thinking of that awareness, even the simplicity of like, it's supposed to be an emoji it's different to regular text. How might that be treated? That's just the kind of thinking that we need to consider with accessibility. And then there are things, great resources in the world that um, such as the WCAG quick reference, I'll put the link in the description, that tells you what you should be considering, whether you're doing a full on accessibility project or you're just considering it one little bit at a time. Um, and then it shows you what that might look like. For example, being able to pause audio, play audio, pause, restart videos, all that sort of stuff. So is there one go-to resource that each of you have that you're like, this is my lifeline for making me build more accessible um, training? And it might be to do with captions, transcripts, um, screen reader, anything to do with accessibility, but you're like, that's my, that's my go-to. When it comes to the WCAG guidelines, I would say I Susie Miller's book on, mm -hmm. I don't remember what it's called, Accessible Learning Content Design or something like that, um, okay. was the one that really helped me make sense of the WCAG guidelines. Because if you just go to the, the W3C website, it's, it's overwhelming and half of it is written for web developers. So I needed somebody mm -hmm. to filter out what really matters for learning designers. So Susie Miller's book. Beautiful. I didn't even know that myself. So I will put it in the description and have a look. And I just, this is what you're referring to here. My tip for this would just be make sure, work through it one by one and highlight is this one relevant to my project? Yes or no? Is this one relevant to my project? Yes or no? Because then you can start through process of elimination, getting rid of certain things that maybe you don't have any videos in your course. Therefore, the video section doesn't apply. So that's how you can make it less overwhelming but if you work through it step by step it can be a lot easier Teresa you got a resource that you love yeah I like the okay. web aim um, the web aim uh, uh, website not just for color contrast but they have other resources and then also Intopia has a map and it's a quick reference map you know I just printed it out and uh, I really love it you know anytime I, I just have a question I refer to the map and it's on their website um, so okay. that that's a great resource and sorry Teresa if I cut over you uh, I, I didn't mean no, to I, I think I spoke yeah. <laughs> I just um, went quickly to my <laughs> shelf to um, to take the book because for me also because when I'm working on, on 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 my desk and I have all my displays like I for me it's easier just to go to to Susie's book and I have ha highlighted some some points mm. and I, I quickly access and I just want to show it because I think it's really like we um it's, it's called design accessible learning content and I think. We talk a lot about the, 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 the basics and the must have books and, you know, and it's also always about um, development and the process, the design process and so on. But I think SUSE is, is also a must have for, for everyone who wants to learn because what I like is that she's focusing on our field, you know, and mm. on our work and she's very to the point on everything what she's um, transmitting. So, yeah. That will be my really my must have. Yeah, beautiful. That's cool. 
All right. And I feel well, like I would have to mention us as well, because what we're doing is basically yeah. we're curating things. So we're, yeah. we're bringing something to the spotlight every two weeks, you know, like last week, I think it was alt text. So what we did was not just ask questions about it and start a conversation, but we curated the, the best websites that we thought would give you the most value in the least amount of time and really apply to e-learning rather than web, web development. Yeah. So yes, and we also have this kind of um, tips, you know, like bite size, really use it, you know it now, go use it um, mm -hmm. kind of tips. Um, so I think I will really recommend people to join the community and be active and ask questions. And we are not experts, but we are trying to also gather people and who, who, who are really specialized in different topics and just like um, help. And, and with advice and yeah so definitely. yeah we would community really like is worth if everything is worth. yeah, Sorry, yeah no, we would really like people to interact you know and if uh, you know there are people with experience and um uh, you know just contribute to the community and uh, you know ask questions or help answer questions um we would love that yeah it's a really nice place everyone because um it's very productive it, there's no like sales or anything it's like literally how can we help people do it so i think that the conversations are very you know this is the how you'd solve that problem or this is a resource that helped me there so i think that's really cool you've got your email list is the linkedin group the best most active place that you're growing or should they check you out anywhere else I think it's the LinkedIn group, yes. Yeah. Because we cool. monitor it, we interact, and we're available there. Yeah, sweet. Okay. Link in the description. Go sign up right now and join that group because it is brilliant. That's why I was learning from it. And I was like, if I'm learning, then we need more people to learn. So, hence why I invited these amazing folk on. Um, team, thank you. Thank you for role modeling today just what it means to consider accessibility and it's like how we kind of evolving and experimenting and questioning together today that's what it is about for me is that it's not right or wrong this or that it's just have we considered and especially us being so big on end users and human-centered design seek to understand and that's what i think came through from your responses today is like are we considering that what's an alternative and i think that's the biggest kind of win from an accessibility kind of momentum growing place to be so yeah i just want to say thank you so much for highlighting and all the value and all the effort that you're bringing by teaching adding value the tips the practical practicality the reflection in your LinkedIn group. Thank you for playing and being put on the spot today and adding the value that you did. You did, I'm very grateful. And I know that the people watching and listening will have learned a lot and you've exposed a lot of things for them to consider. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thanks. I, I thank will you. just like take one minute to recognize and thank you, Beth, because I think um, she, was a, she was the one, you know, like, like at the mm -hmm. beginning, um, asking saying I, I want to do this who, who want to join me and she, she went there and and just put the topic you know like in the community and and as I saw it I knew I wanted to join just like for me kind of a, have a, an accountability on my work you know like and mm. have this learning process together but uh, thank you Yvette for being um, courageous enough and you know like practical enough just to go out there and 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 start building this community no likewise everything what Teresa said <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't have done that without these girls but we yeah we're, we're proud of what we've achieved and we're marching forward yes yeah it's changing the world it's really cool it's very special um people listening you must go follow these people the link is in the description go get yourselves immersed it is like us doing the show like this is our accountability to continuously learn my participation in groups like yours and other ones that I put in my calendar every week to go in and see what's being talked about, see what people are sharing. That learning is my accountability to make sure that I'm building better learning experiences. And I feel like your group is an excellent place 
for that accountability all in one place where it's all curated for me. I don't have to go and Google down some bloody loophole that doesn't actually serve my industry. So yeah, thank you for doing that for us. And everyone, please go check them out and your life will be way better and the solutions that you create will be way better and we'll just make the world a better place. So thank you for watching this episode of the Bell Vista Studio Show. Until next time, be legendary. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Thank you. Thank you for your time. We appreciate it. What's up, awesome human? Thank you, thank you, thank you on behalf of myself and the Bell Vista Studios team for continuously choosing to learn with us. We really appreciate it. If the tips and the insights and the context resonate with you and you want to take your skills to the next level or you want to make your life way easier, you will love our Creator Hub. The Creator Hub is a place for people like you and us. Basically, it's the stuff that we use internally at Bell Vista Studios and then we just share it publicly with you. The Creator Hub is created by instructional designers for instructional designers. And what you'll love there at the moment is we've got a quiz could I be a better instructional designer that has so much tips in the feedback if you're interested in human-centered design or just taking your skills to the next level in terms of the solutions you're creating and the problems you want to solve. But in there as well, aren't we cute? That's us. Um, but we've got the coaching courses, freebies, give us gratitude, and also we've got some templates. And basically they're always around the lens of learning experience design, instructional design, and e-learning. So a human-centered design focus is very much what we're about at Bell Vista Studio. So putting your learners at the heart of a solution and creating something for their needs. So there's the human-centered design stuff, and then we've also got the business stuff. So this is the stuff they don't teach you about when you want to become a freelancer or a consultant in the instructional design world. So go check it out. The link is in the description. You can check out everything that is available for you. Thank you for choosing to learn with us. Continuously invest in your skills. You will be rewarded as an instructional designer. Share this stuff, share it with other people because when we are better instructional designers, we create better solutions that create better humans that create a better world. So we have a very important role and I'm excited to be on this journey with you. Have an awesome day.